Before age 25, I earned my first million dollars. I built my first house mortgage-free and I bought my first car cash. Keep in mind, I was born into poverty. I didn't win the lottery, nor did I do anything illegal to earn this money. Whether you want to earn your millions in US dollars, in Jamaican dollars, or in pounds or euros, you are in the right place. And since we're talking about money, make sure you watch this video carefully to the end because we'll be giving away some money here today. That said, what are you waiting for to earn your first million? Now, before I can dive into the topic, you must be wondering what makes Odetta qualified to talk to us about making a million dollars. So let me just give you a little bit of history. As I said earlier, I made my first million by age 25. That was more than 20 years ago. I was born into poverty and I started from zero dollars. I didn't have any inheritance. I did not win any money and I did not commit any crimes. On top of all of that, I was not born into a pampered situation. I lost my father to criminality when I was six years old. He was trying to escape the police. My mother was a teenage parent. She had to figure out quickly how to make ends meet. As such, I was raised by my extended family. I did not graduate from high school, I dropped out of college the first time, and I was sexually molested, raped, and impregnated twice before age 17. So I've had my share of obstacles, and some of them were self-inflicted, but the point is I was still able, despite all that, to make my first million before age 25. So I hope that gives me some amount of credibility to speak to you on the subject matter today. That said, I could have made excuses, but you know what? I chose instead to make changes, and that's what I'm gonna teach you how to do. Now, before I dive into the subject matter, I must tell you that this is a precursor to a course that I've been developing that will be ready for 2022. It will be an amazing way to kickstart that year. This course will be delivered online, or it will be delivered in person at our Goffa product studio in Kingston. And stay tuned, I'm gonna tell you a lot more about that. So during this video today, whenever you hear me reference that course, which right now I'm calling the Financial Freedom Success Strategy, that's what I'm talking about. Now, let me first say that I am not a financial advisor. It's not my area of expertise. All I'm doing here today in this video is just sharing my personal experiences and my perspective. If you choose to adopt any or all of what I'm sharing today, note you do so at your own risk. If you opt, however, to enroll in the course, I will actually introduce you to financial advisors that I have used that provide services at no cost, which is important when you're going from zero dollars to a million dollars. Just a word of caution when you're evaluating your financial or your wealth advisor, if they have been in the business for a long time and they are not doing well financially, you may want to get your advice elsewhere. Because how can they tell you how to be wealthy or rich or to earn your first million when they have not? It's 
it's very in this video today i'll only share five of the 10 strategies that i used to earn my first million we just don't have enough time i do share all 10 in details in the course whether in the form of a case study or otherwise and i do tell a lot of the story in my book but before we jump into it i must tell you what inspired me to earn my first million so early it was my why and my why is what hurts or haunts me that's the definition i came up with in my book and those things will make you cry they certainly made me cry they had me worrying around the clock and it's what stops you from quitting when that thought is crossing your mind so my first big why started during hurricane gilbert which was in 1988 as the storm was passing i was certain that i would have been homeless myself along with my family members i lived with my extended family we lived in an old deteriorated board house that was compromised and i was certain that that hurricane was going to destroy our home to this day i'm sure it's my grandmother's prayers that kept our roof on so at age 11 as i huddled in a corner fearful that our home would be destroyed i had my first big dream which was to knock down that old board house and replace it with a nice concrete house that would fit all my eight family members that i lived with and that became such a powerful why that before i built the house whenever there was a storm or a hurricane threatened i would worry so much that at times it would bring me to tears. So it was a powerful why, because I was so concerned for my family, even though at the time I was not living at home. My son became my most powerful why. I gave birth to him at age 17. And of course, at that age, I'm neither prepared financially or emotionally to take care of a child, but I had to step up. Because I made a decision to bring a child into the world prematurely, I had to take responsibility. And his welfare and catering to him became my biggest why. So what is your why? I want you to comment below if you have one. If you don't, you definitely need one before you embark on this path to earning your first million dollars. So the first strategy that I used to earn my first million was I diversified my income. And this one is somewhat obvious, but I'm gonna share with you how I did it specifically and what worked for me. So I focused on two things, earning multiple streams of income and multiple types of income. So first, let's talk about the different types of income that I used. I used active income, passive income, and portfolio income. Active income is basically trading time for money. I had a job, I got a paycheck, I worked several hours per week, 40 to 60 at times because it was very demanding, and at the end of the month, I got a paycheck. I traded time for money. That's risky business because if for whatever reason I can no longer work, then I lose that source of income. So I didn't want to rely on my active income only on my path to making my first million. That was too risky. The second source of income for me was passive income. And this is when you're not actively involved in earning that income. You might have to do something upfront, whether it's expending effort, resources, or an investment of time. But after you do it initially or periodically, you continue to earn while you sleep, while you vacation, or as I'm talking to you right here, I'm earning. Passive income also includes rental properties, business investments. If you write a book and you put that book online in the format of an ebook or an audiobook, you do it once, you keep earning from it. Royalties that people in music, artists earn, they 
make the song and they keep earning from it in perpetuity, that's also considered to be passive income. And I used passive income towards my first million. The third income source that I used is portfolio income. And I really like this one because I figured out over the years how to make my money work for me. The money that's received from investments, dividends, capital gains or interest is considered portfolio income. So if you, for example, invest in bonds, those coupons or that interest that you get on an annual basis is considered portfolio income. So I hope you got the income types right. Now, although I enjoyed the security of earning active income, I knew from a very early age that that was not going to be my only source of income. I was a hustler as early as age eight. Listen, at eight years old, I got my grandmother to help me to bake a cake. I used my notebook from school to create tickets. I sold those tickets to my classmates, my neighbors, anybody I could find. And they were raffle tickets. And on a particular day, I raffled and chose a winner for that cake. I made a tidy profit and at eight years old, I started to diversify my income. I started my loan business where I would lend my family members and my schoolmates money and take back a little extra when they were paying it in the form of interest. I also hosted fun days where I charged persons to participate in activities like bun eating contests and I sold food at those events. I think I was born to be a hustler. The beauty of it is whether you're born to be a hustler or not, with a powerful why, you will do what is necessary to earn that first million. One of the skill sets that I learned from very early with my hustling is sales. And I must tell you that sales is underrated. With sales, you don't need academic qualification in most instances. You don't need a lot of upfront capital to begin with. You can do it as a side hustle so you can have your active income and have a side hustle where you're selling things. Most people start businesses from their side hustle, which is usually through sales. All you need to sell is passion and everyone can sell. Now you're thinking to yourself, no, I'm not a seller. I was not born a seller. That's crap. If you are making excuses, you can sell. When you say, oh, I was late for work because I had a flat tire or the taxi broke down and I had to go figure out how to get another means of transportation to get to work, you are convincing that person with your excuses and making yourself more believable. Sales is no different. If I'm selling you this remote control, I'm basically saying you should buy this remote control because I was late because if you get as good with sales as you are with making excuses, your first million will not be a problem. So let's evaluate some of my active income sources towards my million dollar journey. I worked at what was Xerox when I was leaving, but at some point it was MRS and ACS. And I worked there for close to 15 years. Of course, I went back to school during that time. I was basically earning active income, trading time for money. I became a supervisor at age 23, a manager at age 24, and a VP by age 25. I earned a six-figure income as a VP, and that was excellent active income, but I wasn't satisfied. It's not because it wasn't sufficient or because I was not grateful why I wasn't satisfied. It was because at any point in time, somebody could think I'm not doing a good job and pull the rug from under me and I would lose that income. So I had to get some side hustles. And because of that mindset, I always had to have side hustles. So when I was in college, for example, I sold entrance tickets at the Walter Fletcher Beach. I did it for three years on weekends and every single public holiday. I didn't have spare time. I didn't need it. I was working to prepare for the spare time I have today. 
I had a summer job every single summer holiday when I was in college. Whether I was working at Sumfest or at Blue Diamond or I was doing pageants like Miss City and Miss Montego Bay trying to find sponsors and coordinating coronations, I was heavily involved in those summer jobs. I also worked one summer for Quartz Jamaica as a junior manager and that was because I won a scholarship when I was in college. I took photos and sold while I was in college. Back then we didn't have digital cameras. So getting photographs ready in 24 hours became a niche and I certainly capitalized on it. I sold lollipops, guys. As a VP, I drove across rural St. James and sold clothing and accessories on weekends from my vehicle. I also transformed a room in my house into a store. I called it Design by Appointments. If you are a customer of mine, comment below and let me know. I sang at hotels, yeah. I know that one is hard to believe because you have heard me sing. In a turn and, walk away. <laughs> and I post it on my Instagram page all the time. And I know today it really sounds more like I'm croaking or as my husband says, making a joyful noise. But back then, I was good enough to sing at a hotel and earn money. I also taught myself how to trade foreign exchange as another means of active income. I lectured at the Montego Bay Community College and I was a speaker. I spoke at events and I charged a small amount. So those were my active income sources. The one I dived into the most was retail. Like I said, I believe I was born a hustler. I found products that satisfied a need for people and I sold them at a profit. It was very simple. And this was obviously before e-commerce. The products that I found back then were the old navy flip-flops. If you were going crazy over those flip-flops back in the day, comment below. And also the old navy tank tops that were extremely popular. I was traveling a lot for work, my flight, my hotel, my rental car was paid for. So I used the weekends to shop and because I didn't have to expend a lot of money to get to where I was shopping, I was able to sell at lower margins and lower prices. So I bought these flip flops from Old Navy. I only bought them on sale at $2.50 US per pair, which at the time was about 90 Jamaican dollars. The vendors in Jamaica, they were selling these flip-flops for 500 Jamaican dollars, which at the time was about 14 US dollars. I sold them for 300 Jamaican dollars, which was about 8 US dollars, and I made a profit of 220%. Whopping, right? Naturally, I became a wholesaler because now the retailers, all those vendors need to buy from me so that they can still mark it up and make a decent profit. So I was selling flip flops like hot bread and making my $5.50 US profit. Now let's put things into perspective. By selling only 5,000 flip flops at $5.50, I made my first Jamaican million. To make 1 million US dollars, all I'd need to do is to sell 50,000 flip flops and tank tops. But because this was not my only source of income, I didn't need to sell 50,000, but I promised you I sold a lot. So I basically focused on retail as my active side hustle strategy. Now let's talk about my passive income sources that I used on my journey to making my first million. Like I said, I was a VP at Xerox. And at the time I invested in a bar, a haberdashery, a barber, a salon, and a clothing and accessory store that my family members ran on my behalf. When I traveled, I would buy products for this business and I would also travel into Kingston periodically to buy products that I would sell in this business. The second passive income source was one of my favorites. And you know why? Because this source helped me to help others. 
So I started a taxi business by chance. My cousin came to me and said, Sandy, which is my pet name, can you buy me a car and I'll pay you back? Without second thought, I went ahead. Of course, my cousin told his friend who came to me and said, can you buy me a car and I'll pay you back? In a very short period of time, I purchased eight additional cars and I gave them to young men in my community who were either unemployed or underemployed. And they drove these cars for two to three years. They would pay me on a weekly basis, of course, with a profit, and they owned the car. They took exceptional care of the motor vehicles because they know it was going to be theirs. And my uncle helped me to manage day-to-day -day operations. So basically, I invested time and resources to buy eight additional cars. And every week for two to three years, I earned passive income as my uncle occasionally checked in and made sure things were going well with those cars. That was my second source. My third source, which gets a lot of bad rap, was network marketing, believe it or not. I was able to find a product. It was called a DTA box, which is a digital telephone adapter and a video camera, which allowed video calls back then, which was trending because at the time, of course, there were no cell phones and international calls were very expensive. This device allowed anyone who had it globally to talk for only $24.99 US dollars per month. And if they had the video phone, they would be able to see who they're talking to. So Jamaicans who had family overseas they were able to converse in an unlimited manner for only $24.99 per month. Now I made money when I sold those devices initially, but that wasn't the passive income because that required me to sell. But every single month when they paid those bills, I earned passive income or residual income in this case. So that was my third source of passive income. Now let's talk about my portfolio income sources. And like I said, this is my favorite and I've optimized this and it's why I was able to retire in my early forties. I only save and invest in US dollars and that's because it helps me to avoid currency devaluation issues and it offsets inflation to a certain degree. Back then I invested in US stocks, bonds and unit trusts. I dabbled in real estate a little bit, but I'm not a fan of real estate investments. And you're probably thinking, oh, she has no idea what she's saying. That's me. The return on investment or the ROI is just too long. I can figure out 10 different ways to make more money in less time than buying a property and hoping that I live to 10 15 or 30 years for me to start making money off of it. Now, of course you have real estate investment that you can start earning initially because your capital outlay is less than what you're earning from the property. But then again, that capital outlay is huge and I try to avoid it. I can figure out how to make a million dollars, a million ways without real estate. And I'll tell you more in my course. As it pertains to my portfolio income sources, I had to learn to develop a medium risk appetite because the only way to earn a million dollars in your twenties is to take risks by investing. There's no two ways about it. Here's the power of compound interest and investing. If you start at the exact same age, 20, and you invest in a product that gives you 10% interest per annum after taxes and fees, you only need to invest $70 monthly and that's 70 US dollars monthly to be able to be a US millionaire by age 65 when you retire or 400 Jamaican dollars per day. That's less than the cost of most lunch. What's your excuse? This is why I had to invest and stop saving. So now we're going to give away some cash right in the comments. My two wise that I mentioned earlier for a chance to win.
Before we move on, I have to tell you a few of the lessons I learned when I was diversifying my income years ago. The first is that I never allowed my pride or my ego to get in the way of my goals. And you shouldn't either. I know people were looking down on me when I was selling lollipops as a VP in a Fortune 500 company or when I sold clothing from my vehicle. But people's opinion of me has never paid my bills. When it starts, I'll start paying more attention to it. But until such time, their opinion of me is irrelevant. Also, I had to become very mindful of the advice that I got from people who were not where I was going or where I wanted to be. Bankers who were telling me how to get rich when they weren't rich. People telling me that my staff wouldn't respect me because of my hustle. My staff didn't only respect me, they were actually able to identify with me, which gave me more leverage with them. So I had to learn to filter out a lot of what I had heard because I knew that they had not been where I was going and therefore they cannot tell me how to get there. Now the second strategy that I employed on my path to making my first million in my 20s was to dominate my debts and limit my liabilities. I didn't want to waste money paying debts. And I've always felt that the returns from my assets should pay for my liabilities. For example, if I wanted to buy a car, some of my investment interest should really cover that car note. And that's the philosophy in which I operated still today, but especially back then when I was on this journey. Your house is a liability unless you earn more from it than you pay to maintain it or pay for your mortgage. It's very straightforward. So when you're thinking about limiting your liabilities, you need to think about your house as one of them. When I needed to get a loan, I made sure I negotiated the interest to the T. I played different institutions against each other. I would go to one, get a particular interest rate, go to the other, tell them what I was getting, because don't feel like they're not playing us. So we need to use their games to get the best out of these financial institutions. In all cases, I would earn US dollars and borrow in Jamaican dollars because as the dollar devaluates, which is really unfortunate, paying that loan became easier. And I'll explain that in my course in details because it's important that you figure out how to capitalize on that and use it to your advantage. So on my path to earning my first million, I borrowed as little as possible. As I said earlier, I built my first house without a mortgage by age 25, and it wasn't easy. I tell the story in my book, but it was possible because I was able to do it. I bought my first car cash, and the second car that I bought, I actually bought it to sell clothing from, and at the time I was building the house, so it was an SUV, so I used the trunk space to carry construction material when I was able to. Despite all that, I still paid off for it in 18 months. So here was my formula as it pertains to loans. Before the ink dries on the loan documents that I'm signing, I developed the strategy and the strategic plan to pay off that loan. And I always try to pay it off in a quarter of the allotted time. The reason why I treat debt that way is because I believe debt is really a way of living beyond your means. Think about it. You can't afford it, which is why you have to borrow money to acquire it. But debt is sometimes necessary, which is why it's important to figure out how to optimize it. It's because of this mindset why today I don't have a mortgage. I don't have vehicle payments or any other loan for that matter. Now the third strategy I used to make my first million was to save and invest and my target was 50% of my total earnings. 20% is good, 10% is recommended, 
It's because I saved 50% of my income from back then why I could retire in my early 40s. Don't think it's because I earned a lot of money why I was able to save 50%. Even when I was earning $1,350 per week, which was minimum wage, I was saving 50%. And that's why this course is so important because it teaches you how to make the most of little. There were times when I couldn't save 50%. 50%. And instead of cutting back on my expenses, I opted instead to find other streams of income. I'm not fond of the cutting back on expenses path because if you do that soon there will be no more expenses to cut back on and then you start compromising your mental health and your physical health because the sacrifices that you're making, it's just not sustainable. Now, to be able to save 50%, I had to budget and set specific financial goals. In my book, No Regret Stress Lessons, I share the budget template that I use and I will be making it available later on to you. If you are in the course, you will have access to that template. And it has formulas in it and everything you will need to drive your savings and to get to your first million dollars. I had to make a lot of sacrifices to save 50%. The one that comes to mind readily is when I did not buy any clothing or shoes for three years when I was building my first house. And on the day we were buying furniture when the house was done, I was in courts taking out furniture on higher purchase because I was broke. But I had the house and that's what mattered. And walking down the stairs, my shoes, because I didn't buy any for so long, they were dry rot and the heel fell down the stairs and rolled. And I went down there and picked it up with a lot of pride and grace because I would just done something that many people in their lifetime will never do, which was to build a 5,000 square feet house with multiple living rooms, eight bedrooms, five bathrooms by age 25. So I had to sacrifice clothing, shoes, eating out, traveling, shopping, doing all the cool things that most people do in their 20s to build that house. But what a worthwhile experience. Now, my fourth strategy was to account for every single dollar I earned and to optimize my spending. I never buy full price if I'm able to. I always buy on sale. When I go into a store, I go to the sales rack first and nothing changes today. I still try to do that. I was shopping at Bashko, which is like a Walmart, but significantly cheaper. When I was a vice president, earning six figures, and that's a US six figure salary. So it wasn't because I couldn't afford to shop elsewhere. It was because I was able to find good quality products for a good price because quality does matter in my equation. I don't want to keep buying the same product because I compromise on the quality. Back then, I only bought my groceries from wholesalers. I bought my meat from the meat shop directly and I went to the market to buy my groceries because I was able to cut cost by doing that. I turned off every single light when not in use. I still do it today. And I don't spend time on the phone talking to run up my phone bill. I don't believe in spending my hard earned money paying bills, whether that's a phone bill, an electricity bill or a cable bill. So I manage those things very, very closely. I use coupons. Remember, no pride or no ego. And I collect discount cards from every single place I go. As a matter of fact, one of the discount cards that I make sure is signed every time I use it is at La Shushan to get my green juice. They have a discount card there. If you don't have one and you drink green juice, you should get one. Your 11th signature will get you a free green juice. I love cards like that and I never forget to get them signed. The $5 here, the $2 there, the $10 here, it does add up. 
The fifth strategy that I used to earn my first million was I had to figure out how to protect my investment, my savings, and my assets. I had to get very savvy with insurance, whether that was insuring my home to ensure that if God forbid, and there's a fire, I didn't have to go into my investment to take out money to build a new house because I had insurance to fall back on. Vehicle insurance, that one is kind of automatic, but critical illness insurance, this is critical because the fastest way to dwindle your investments or your savings is for somebody or yourself to get sick. It takes a lot of money to care. So having an insurance that takes care of that, it removes the burden and it's a way of protecting your investment. You know what's amazing about insurance? When you have it, nothing happens. If you don't have it, everything happens. So I actually am gonna do a whole video on what insurance policies I have and how I use them to my advantage or how I have used them in the past to my advantage. To protect my investments, I also chose products that were backed by strong companies. So bonds that were backed by strong companies with healthy profit margins to ensure that if something went wrong, I had a backup. I also invested with only reputable companies. I did not do the Olin's or the cash plus type investments. And if you're in the US, the made off, no, I didn't do those. It looked too good to be true, so I knew it wasn't true. Let me say none of us are perfect, but if I had invested in those, I would have pulled off the interest and not allow it to roll over and compromise the principal and the interest. Now, those are all the strategies I have time to share today. I have several more and they will be covered in my course. Let me just give you a high level overview on a few of them. The first is I had to learn how to believe in myself because you cannot earn a million dollars if you don't trust your judgment, if you don't believe in your potential, and if you don't believe you are capable of earning that million dollars to begin with. So when I share the story in my book where I refused to take that job because they were underpaying me, that taught me some very valuable lessons. One of the lessons I learned back then when I stood up for myself and advocated to earn based on what I thought I was worth, for the very first time in my life, I actually realized that I could be desired and not valued. I also had to develop strategies to overcome adversities because life is never smooth sailing. And if I didn't figure out how to stop being a victim of my circumstances and to overcome obstacles and make that second nature, there was no way I would have earned a million dollars. Mindset change was also so important. I had to develop character traits and I talk about this a lot in my book around forgiveness, gratefulness, and kindness. I'll give you an example. When I was 12 years old, a young man in my community jumped and gave me a roundhouse kick in my chest that left me on my back in the middle of the road. I was embarrassed and I was resentful. But many years later, I hired this same young man to work on my second house and he saved me a ton of money. So I had to develop character traits like forgiveness because it actually helped me on my path to making my million dollars. Another strategy that I won't be able to cover in detail is just choosing what my major was in college. I was supposed to be a world-renowned architect. At least that's what I aspired to do when I was in high school. But after getting pregnant, dropping out of college and becoming homeless, I had to rewire my thought process and find new aspirations. And because I was always a hustler, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So choosing to do business in college was important. What you choose to do in college is gonna help you to become a millionaire faster. 
So don't just treat that decision trivially, put some thought into it because that decision will definitely impact your journey. Importantly, I also had to give back and help others to get my first million. And I didn't give to get, but what I realized was the more I give was the more I got. There was a time in my life when I felt like money was just falling from the sky. And I'll give you an example. I remember when I worked at Sutherland and we were on the university campus, there was a young man who was struggling to pay his tuition. So I spoke to my management team and we all dibbed up and raised some money that helped to offset this young man's tuition. But it was short 25,000 Jamaican dollars, which back then was about 250 US dollars. And I just offered to pay the difference. That same day when we gave him the money, it was Christmas time. I remember it clearly. I was driving to the supermarket to do my Christmas shopping and I got a call from the CEO's office, surprisingly. And it was to announce that I was getting a bonus and this bonus was 100 times what I had just given to this young man. What did I tell you about money falling from the sky? I'm going to share some testimonials with you during this course. And there are a lot of them in my book that confirms that when you give, you get more. You shouldn't give to get though. And you shouldn't embarrass the people that you're giving to boost your small ego. No, don't go out there and say, oh, I gave this to such and such because you want to feel good about yourself. That's not the kind of giving I'm talking about. Give from the heart. And don't just give people who you think are in need. That's it. Thanks for watching. This is the first episode in our financial freedom series. Next up, how to make your first Here's another giveaway. Share why you want to be a millionaire below in the comments for a chance to win.